Hi everyone, um, I'm Annika Govel and I'm a rising junior at Deep Run High School in Virginia. I've been part of Girl Up since 2017 and I'm secretary of the Girls of CIT Club at my school and CIT is the Center for Information Technology. Um, I'm really passionate about ensuring that women go into STEM fields and that's why I'm excited to talk with Aparna Bawa, COO of Zoom, about her journey into the STEM field and how she came to be in her leadership position. Welcome, Aparna. I'm really excited to have you here for this fireside chat. Thank you, Annika. It is so nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you too. Okay, so um, starting with the first question, how did you become COO of Zoom? And like many of us here are turning in, are tuning in or in high school or college. Did you know from a young age that you wanted to be in a STEM field? So first question, how did I become COO of, June, of Zoom? Um, it starts at a young age. And I think you have to do a few things. Number one, take advantage of every opportunity that comes your way that you're interested in. Um, it could be something that's hard to do. It could be something that um, you know, seems like a big rock, like a huge challenge uh, where people that are outside of your control have influences and sort of impact the way you do things. It doesn't matter. If you get an opportunity that you want to work on, you should take it. Um, number two, I would say, feel very confident that you can do anything you set your mind to. If I had listened to people, well-intentioned people along the way who would advise me, you know, maybe you should set your sights a little lower um, because it's something more achievable or you know, you'll have a greater chance of success, then I wouldn't be here today in all honesty. And the third thing I would say is you have to take a little bit of risk. You have to put yourself in uncomfortable positions. Um, good things, they, they, there's a reward at the end for a reason. It's because you, know, you put yourself out there in order to achieve that outcome. And so taking a little bit of risk, even though you don't exactly know how the outcome is gonna end up um, is important. And also coupling that with making sure you've done the things that set you up for success is also important. So, you know, stepping outside of your comfort zone, but then, you know, making sure, make, giving an insurance policy that says, okay, I, what I can control, I do well, that's also very important. I would say at a high level, if I think back to the evolution of my career and the evolution of my sort of learning through that career, those are the three key themes that I would take away. Wow, that's really interesting. Um, did you have parents or mentors who supported you along the way? Absolutely. Um, parents are very important. So I remember my dad uh, not really treating me like a girl or a boy, sort of just a person who could do anything they wanted to. Um, I don't know that I figured out that there was, you know, a situation where people can treat you differently, you know, based on being a woman or a man until I was 25 because my parents had established that very early on. If you wanna play basketball, you play basketball. If you wanna you know, comb Barbie's hair, you can, well, you can comb Barbie's hair. Does your, do you want your favorite color to be blue or orange? Go for it. Um, my parents never inculcated that sort of gender view on us, um, my sister and myself. And so we, we ourselves, had a view that we could do anything we wanted to. I think it shocked me for the first time when I realized that, you know, at the time when I was growing up, that women, for example, could not be in first line combat in the military, in the US military, and it surprised me. Um, so it's those kinds of things that, you know, we need to make sure that we're doing for our girls, making sure that they understand that, you know, the, the world is the oyster and there's no limit in what they can do. Yeah, definitely. Um, do you think it's important to have mentors and to, like, how can we seek mentors out for us? So I do think it's important to have mentors, but I actually think it's very important for young women to understand the difference between mentorship and sponsorship. 
So a mentor is someone that you know you look up to, and you can have many different mentors that have particular characteristics or have exhibited success in particular areas that you want to emulate. So you try, you know, as a, as a mentee, your job is to try to figure out how to gain that knowledge from them and incorporate that in that knowledge or that learning into your life. And so, you know, I have mentors, you know, that cover ver various different aspects of life. So I will have a personal mentor that helps me figure out how to interact with my children. I could have a, you know, a professional mentor who helps me figure out how to make a point using less words, um, those kinds of topics. I want to separate that from the idea of sponsorship. In your career, you are well suited or benefited by having someone who doesn't necessarily um, take a control or take responsibility for helping you figure out things and leading the way or sort of teaching you things that they know that you that could be useful to you but actually have your back when it counts when you are up for a new opportunity and they can say in a room that you're not in yes i know that person and this person is the right person for us to back she's got the the qualities we need as a leader a future leader and we should give her that opportunity it's the difference between mentorship and sponsorship and i think a lot oftentimes i uh, find women young women especially confusing those concepts um, a mentor, someone that you want to learn from, you can probably be more free with, expose your vulnerabilities. A sponsor, you have to cultivate that relationship in a slightly different way, in my view. Um, remember, they are the ones advocating for you in your organization when you're not in the room. And they need to know the critical points that make you, you know, that make you successful for a particular role. Yeah, that makes sense. Um... I'm starting to think about what I want my college major to be. Is it okay to switch and explore other majors? Did you? You know what? I did. I went into college thinking I was going to be a political science major. And then I thought, you know, maybe government history or government and history. Um, you know, I, I took an accounting class, which I think was required and I loved it. Uh, I'd always been really good between numbers and words. I can do Word and Excel. It was a joke at the time. Um, and so, you know, when I, when I enjoyed the accounting class and took another finance class, I decided that that, you know, I would try my hand at that. I think nowadays, I think the situation is different. When, we, when I went into college, you didn't have to pick your major. No college expected you to pick your major. You know, you wouldn't not get into a college based on your major or vice versa, get into a college based on your major choice when you're a freshman. Um, I think it's, it's if you, that's not to say you shouldn't pick your major. If you have a very, cause there are some high school students that have a very clear view on what they wanna do in life yeah. and there is no diverting them. If that is the case, go for it. You know, that is gonna make you happy. If it's not the case, picking a major that maybe makes your parents happy or fits some expectation that people, other people have for you is gonna end up putting you into a path that ultimately you're not gonna feel passionate about. And if you don't feel passionate about it, guess what? The likelihood of you being good at this and actually delivering some value down the road and contributing to society is probably smaller. That's not to say it won't be there. It's just the likelihood or the probability is smaller. So I would say if there's any doubt in your mind as to what you want to do in life, and as a freshman in college, you certainly aren't obligated to decide what you want to do in life. I think I'm 42 and I'm still figuring out what I want to do in life because you know, life is long. Mm -hmm. um, you should definitely keep your options open and explore. The best thing I think you can do for yourself in this high school and college time frame is get to know yourself and understand not necessarily who, you know, what major will I be? What will I achieve in life? But who do I wanna be and what am I? And what do I stand for? And what, I, what do I like? What gets me out of bed? What is the topic that will make me work hard even though someone else is telling me, is not telling me that I have to. I don't have my parents at home, you know, pushing me to do things. I'm in college by myself. What is it that will get me to going and get me passionate without someone else telling me to do something. And I think that's the question 
that kids these days have to answer for themselves. And it's not easy. It's not easy to separate out all the influences that we have from the outside and find out what do we want to be? Who do we want to, you know, emulate? And what kind of values do we want to stand for? Uh, yeah, that's really good advice. I know, like, I am kind of undecided about what I want to do. So I need to do a lot of thinking. <laughs> um, how do you feel about being a female and a person of color at a tech company? Have you always felt supported in the leadership roles you've held? No. I mean, that's the, the fact of the matter. I have not felt always supported, but what do you do about it? Um, I mean, that's the question I think you have to ask yourself, um, or I had to ask myself. The reality is the, you know, the opportunities for women have evolved over time such that I have more opportunity than my mother did. And my mother had more opportunity than my grandmother did. And I see that, you know, happening for the next generation and the next generation going forward. In any, in any point in time, there are going to be women who feel like they are inside, in and of themselves, light years ahead of the society around them. Um, and there's two options. Number one, you try to make change. So for me, it's when you see something and it's, you know, obviously needs to be corrected, you say it especially if you're in a position of power, especially if you have that following or the ability to do it. And, you know, I've reached that part of my career where I do think I have that ability. The other part is when you're not in a position of power and you're not in that position to sort of make bold statements and get a following that actually, you know, goes along with you. So what do you do then? I think you have to, when, when something is fundamentally wrong, and you feel it happening to you or you feel it happening to someone around them, around you, you have to gauge what is the consequence here and how important is this situation? I would say, speak up, fight for, you know, your position or your, you know, an injustice that you see outside of, you, of your position if the consequence is, is tremendous. You can't sweat all every single thing like you can't sweat all the small stuff you you also as a woman you know growing going up in your own sort of career be agitating for the smallest issues that may not even be sort of you know on purpose so i would say assess the materiality of the issue at hand and definitely agitate change will not come without agitation but at the same time time also solves some of these issues. Mm, yeah. Um, and what advice do you have for girls who feel discriminated against, whether that be in school, sports, or elsewhere? I'm, th I'm just smiling because I'm just thinking about sports, and that is so often the case. And frankly, you know, um, you see it right now with sort of the, the social momentum that is happening with Black Lives Matter movements, et cetera. Um, and that if you toss in the gender dynamic, it's, it's tough. I mean, it's really tough. Um, I know that in my, our, at Zoom, we have been having conversations and, you know, there is a whole host of um, our Black employees who feel as if they live double lives. Um, and even sort of other employees that are of color say the same thing, but I feel it fresh because of, of, the, of the recent engagement we've had with our black employee base. And then you add on that a black woman who not only feels like they have to live a double life in corporate America, but then has the added responsibility of making sure that sort of their family unit is operating or is functioning in a safe environment. Um, it's a lot of stress. Mm -hmm. What I would say, is there is a little element of survival. Again, if something is fundamentally wrong and the consequence of that, of going along with that, you know, incorrect um, sort of assumption or m mistake um, is tremendous, you have to say something. You owe it to society to say something. I also think in some, sometimes a, um, a carefully 
placed comment, uh, a strategically written down statement can make a huge impact than a lot of noise and a lot of um, commotion. And it can have even much more of a powerful impact on the audience to stop that discrimination. Uh, you know, in some ways, sort of the nonviolence movements, uh, you know, have leveraged that. I know there's a lot of controversy as to whether you, you know, um, agitate or not. I would say the, uh, the last thing is survival. You have to survive and sort of, you know, in a personal way, keep going. And I think that's okay too. Um, balancing both of those, those concepts, as opposite as they may seem, um, are required. Otherwise, you know, you have to, the individual has, still has to go to bed at night and get up in the morning um, and function. And I think that's, that's something that's essential. Well, yeah. Um, as a mother of two young boys, how are you raising them to be allies in the fight for gender equality? My two boys, they don't know any different than their mother going to work. Um, and to the point where, you know, sometimes when I'm between jobs, uh, maybe I've you know, left the company, I'm looking for another job, they get worried. They're, they ask us, are we going to be okay? <laughs> you know, can we still go to school? <laughs> um, which is a nice place to be, to be honest. I, I'm very proud that my sons view the girls in their class um, as frankly smarter and maybe more, more leadership position uh, or leader, more leader-like than themselves. I remember my son in second grade established for me very clearly that the leader of the class was definitely a little girl. Uh, we won't put her name out here publicly, but definitely the little girl and she got to stand front of the line at all the field trips because that's the way it rolled. Uh, I think we have to be intentional as parents to make it clear to our kids that, you know, both boys and girls, that girls have just as much of an equal spot as boys in this society. Yeah. The other thing I would say, it's even more important for my husband to take that position. Um, so I, th the first part I talked about was us modeling that behavior or the women modeling that behavior. But the second part is having your husband or the male figures in the child's life establish that value as well. That speaks volumes um, and it works in our family because my husband is just as much vested in the boys understanding that women have an equal place in the family unit and in society as a whole on all vectors than men. Yeah, that's great that they're like inclusive of everyone. Um, being the COO of Zoom is a pretty big deal. What are some myths that you've uncovered about being a woman in leadership? Myths. Um, I would say that you can't speak your mind. Uh, I think a lot of folks would think that, you know, if I spoke my mind, then people will think I'm a problem, you know, I'm creating a problem or that I have, you know, I'm, I'm saying that, you know, taking a typical viewpoint of a woman, et cetera. And I just don't think that's the case. Mm -hmm. I think it takes all types in the world to solve business problems. Um, it takes all types in the world to solve human problems. We're all not made the same way. And bringing your, showcasing your characteristics in the, to the front and making sure people are aware of your point of view is a good thing. Um, I would say that I get more kudos and more appreciation and I'm more effective when I speak my mind in a way that's respectful to others. I mean, obviously there's a way to do it and a way not to do it, but the answer is, is never to sort of take the, the non-risky way out, especially when you're trying to drive change. So that's a common myth. The other common myth is that we aren't tough. <laughs> yeah. uh, we can be pretty tough. Yeah. Uh, we do it on our day-to-day -day basis. I mean, you know, if I look at my mother and my grandmothers, um, they're all pretty tough women. It, you know, generationally it manifests itself in different ways. It's the same toughness. 
Uh, and I think that that element of strength should be valued um, in society. Yeah, it sucks that these myths like kind of degrade who women really are. So, you know, Annika, one of the things that, you know, it's, it's interesting you say this, it, it actually doesn't degrade who we are. It's more about perception. So one of the challenges, for example, that I faced in my career is that I am very strong and I do state my opinion and I don't back down. And just because someone says no, I don't necessarily take that for an answer. It's been something I've you know, had as a trait since I was a baby, I think. Okay. So my parents tell me. But sometimes because of those stereotypes and because of those myths, the audience or the person I'm speaking to expects something a little bit different out of my mouth. Maybe they expect it because my, my voice is a little high pitched. So maybe they, because it's high pitched, they expect a little bit more flowery. They expect a little bit, you know, I don't know, but that's the perception I have. But when I, it's funny, my, one of my colleagues, also a female said, it's interesting because when you talk, your voice, the sound of your voice and your face and your intonation makes it sound like it's going to be flower. And it comes like, it, it comes out like reinforced steel. And that's, that's a perception, right? And then once people get to know me, then they sort of expect the reinforced steel and they understand. And there's something comforting about strength and reinforced steel. But mm -hmm. if the perception is that it's going to be one way and it comes out the other way, that difference is what causes the jarring response. And that difference is what causes that disconnect between, you know, the myth and the reality. Yeah, that definitely makes a lot of sense. Um, as a final question, what's your favorite part of being in leadership and what advice do you have to those of us who aspire to be a woman in leadership? My favorite part of being in leadership is, it's actually the responsibility and the privilege of really focusing on what are the, the, the big issues and the big problems we face today and how are we going to solve them? And really having the luxury and the ability to prioritize for the company, because that is your job, and saying, we are going to focus on this because it matters, and mm -hmm. not the rest because it ma they matter less. They're not that they don't matter, the other issues don't matter, they matter less for the task at hand. Um, the, the responsibility and the privilege of doing that is tremendous. And if you can achieve that, if you can achieve prioritization and a focus on, you know, first pri prioritization based on strategy and then execution, the outcome, the change that you can make, the, um, the results are fantastic. But it takes a lot to get up to that level where, first of all, you're entrusted with that responsibility and that you have the tools to be able to leverage upon to, to execute on that responsibility. Um, and that is, for me, that's the holy grail in leadership. Um, yeah, that's really, that's good advice. Um, thank you so much, Aparna, for your insight and advice. I know I took away a lot of great insight from our conversation, and I'm sure others did too. Um, thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us, and I look forward to seeing where your STEM and leadership journey take you next. And just um, to wait, one thing, Annika, I, I don't mean to interrupt you. I want to make sure that there are different ways into STEM. I mean, I'm, I was a accounting major in college and a lawyer, definitely not STEM, uh, right. now work for a technology company and about as steeped into technology as you can get. So there are definitely different ways into STEM. Don't, um, I don't want girls thinking that they have to go into it in a certain way. Maybe it's not the typical way, but back to your point about choosing your major, you have to look inside to what motivates you. The key question, if I were to leave one thing for all of our girls is, what's gonna get you out of bed in the morning when you've stayed up all night playing video games? What's gonna get you out of bed in the morning? Because you know you have to do something really, really hard, but, and you want to. I mean, that's the critical question to ask. Yeah, I'll definitely be thinking about that. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. Well, thank you, Annika.